I guess that's better than 65% uh, relative humidity. Yeah, it was basically raining down here. Um, the house started to smell like a um, <clears throat> like a damp basement, and uh, well, I think I solved the problem to an extent with this. A humidifier. I'm sorry, a dehumidifier. Yes. There is a difference between the two. This is a, uh, a frigid air <clears throat> dehumidifier, and it is doing its thing, trying to make this basement less swamp-like and uh, a little more dank. Um, so yeah, that's something that I had to just uh, go and install and purchase and plug in. And, uh, my light bill is going to be really, really high. This thing has been running non-stop for about four freaking days. And uh, it's actually feeling quite nice down here, i got to be honest. And I also built this, a new cover for the, um, for the sump well, or what do they call it, sump pit, in the basement floor. The original cover was completely rotted. It was comprised of two haphazardly placed uh, pieces of rotted pine. And uh, was, uh, the frame that was supposed to hold them in place had rotted almost completely out. So this should last a little while. This is made of pressure treated lumber. Um, it's anchored to the, <clears throat> to the concrete floor. Some heavy duty Tapcon um, bolts. And um, it's cut a piece of scrap plywood, three, three quarter inch plywood. And uh, that comprises the cover. And then sealed the gaps with um, Spray foam, uh, spray foam insulation, which I'll clean this up and I'll put a coat of paint on it, make it look nice and weatherproof it a little bit. But uh, anyway, that's not what you guys came here to see. Let's do a video on a laptop that uh, I wanted to make a video of for quite some time. Let's go ahead and, and do that, shall we? And uh, today we're going to do uh, a much needed computer video. It's been a while since I've done one and that's because I've been so busy doing home repairs and um, just living life and uh, doing family stuff and it's just uh, I haven't really spent a lot of time in my cozy little office down in the basement but that's all gonna change right now. Today I've got for you um, a laptop that I've been wanting to do a video on for a very long time. I've just never gotten my hands on one and I didn't want to go out and buy one. But this one was actually given to me. Um, I've wanted one of these uh, black MacBooks since they were released. Uh, the MacBook line, as you as we know it, the um, the very first Intel MacBook or MacBook. <laughs> When they went from the uh, the iBooks to the MacBooks, they switched from, of course, G4s to uh, to Intel processors, and uh, they first started out with the Intel Core Duo, and they later went to the Core 2 Duo. I became an Apple certified technician when these products were released. Um, I was certified for the first time in um, I want to say November of '07, somewhere around that time frame. And these were current products offered by the uh, the kind folks at Cupertino. And um, I always wanted one of these um, just because I think it's a beautiful laptop. I never was crazy about the white iBooks and MacBooks. They just never did it for me because they looked unprofessional and the white showed scratches very easily, the white glossy finish. But when Apple released their Black Sheep, um, I, I kind of, uh, I, I grew attached to them. But I, the thing is, I never really saw one until one day. Um, so my organization that I worked for then and still work for to this day, um, we bought hundreds, hundreds of white, I, uh, white iBooks and MacBooks. We never bought the black ones because they were the higher spec models and we just didn't really have that, uh, that budgeted. So we never got these in. And then one of my coworkers um, had to order a new laptop for herself for professional use. And this is what she bought because she was given a budget and this fell within that budget. 
and um, she basically checked off all the boxes and bought the best one she could get uh, for what was available to her uh, funding wise and this laptop was in continual use until about 2011 or so so it had a good run um, it was bought new in uh, According to Lowell and Mac, this model was released in uh, this particular iteration in February of 08, and she probably bought it around the new year um, of, of 09, and um, I'm sorry, of 08, so probably early on. Yeah, I got that all mix, mi mixed up. She probably bought it uh, sometime in, um, in mid-2008, and it was discontinued in October 14th of 2008. These laptops aren't nearly as rare as I thought they were, um, because they were they were priced, if I recall, they were pretty damn close to MacBook Pro territory. Uh, according to LEM, the original MSRP of this model was around fifteen hundred dollars, which that wasn't really an insignificant sum of money in two thousand eight. Um, I believe the MacBook Pro started at around. You know, for the for the 13 inch. Okay, so the the Core 2 Duo 15 inch 2008 MacBook Pro retails for two thousand dollars. So yeah, I guess you were within five hundred dollars of a MacBook Pro. But nevertheless, um, I feel that the black uh, MacBook was one of the better looking of the uh, of the two and um, more professional. And uh, I really wanted one, but I never could uh, afford one. And when I finally could. I decided to just go for a 20 inch iMac. Uh, I went with a 2008 iMac 2.4 and um, and the rest is history. So this particular MacBook is a survivor. Um, it is in absolutely perfect condition. Um, I, I don't usually see them in, in this condition and as I've mentioned in past videos um, when I find something from years gone by that's in unusually good condition, I usually snap it up. I don't bother saving all the other stuff. This way, um, anything that I have in my collection is usually top-notch condition-wise, um, if not spec-wise. So I was um, <clears throat> I was a young Apple tech when this came into my uh, into my organization and. Um, the individual who purchased it uh, for for her use um, on the job, um, you know, she was a very particular person. I'm still friends with her to this day. She retired shortly after uh, after she bought this and handed it off to her next uh, successor. But she was a very particular person. Um, if you uh, if you know if you're familiar with librarians, um, she was kind of like a librarian in how she took care of her stuff. Librarians are usually very particular, um, but this person was borderline obsessive, compulsive. Um, so this thing wasn't allowed to see dust or fingers or anything. I, I swear to God, she used an external keyboard with it for the longest time. The one thing that drives me nuts about the black MacBook is that uh, the batteries that I was stocking in my in my repair section, uh, my repair shop, um, I only bought the white ones because, well, that's what we had. Unfortunately, this baby got a white battery. So I'm going to go ahead and look for a black battery for this one. Um, I think it's worth the effort. Why not? Well, I still can. But if you just take a good look at it, I mean, you can see there are an absolute lack of scratches, scuffs, dings, dents, cracks. And it doesn't seem to suffer from one of the flaws that the white MacBook uh, models seem to suffer from almost excessively. Uh, they used to crack right at the nose edge of the keyboard. Um, and if any of you guys, gals, who... Uh, who worked on apples back then you'll know what I'm talking about but they used to crack all along this edge and it was a subject of a um, almost a, what, what I what I want to call a hidden recall it wasn't a recall but it was an extended service program that Apple offered and I ended up replacing about 200 keyboards for this exact problem free of charge um, but what would happen is they would develop this little stress cracks and they were more of an annoyance or a, um, a cosmetic blemish than anything else. Um, but they always cracked. And the replacement keyboards cracked as well. 
It's kind of a funny thing. Um, almost like when the MacBooks, uh, the unibody MacBooks, started having um, the uh, the rubber coating coming off the base cover. And Apple would, if you complained loudly enough, they would give you a new cover uh, for up to three years past the purchase date. But this laptop is in, is in mint condition. So I'm going to go over some of the specs on this machine. Um, so it is a Core 2 Duo uh, Penryn 2.4 GHz processor. Um, this is the T8300. It features 3 MB of shared on-chip level 2 cache, 800 MHz front side bus, 2 GB uh, from the factory of DDR2-667 RAM. A 250 gigabyte SATA hard drive, which it still has. Uh, the RAM has been upgraded to 4 gigabytes. I did that yesterday. So that is now up to 4. It supports a maximum of 6 gigabytes. Um, and the hard drive does feature a sudden motion sensor if it has the stock Apple drive. If you replace the drive with a non-stock drive, you may lose that feature. Um, but anyway... The maximum OS that this machine supports, according to LEM or lowendmac.com, is going to be, um, it actually supports 10.75, which is surprising. I didn't think it did, but it does. So there you have it. I mean, it's, it'll also run Windows XP Service Pack 2. A lot of the MacBooks that we had at work um, actually ran, um, we were running boot camp on them and we'd throw Windows XP or whatever. Um, so, yeah, let's fire it up. The battery holds a full charge. Um, it's a very low use battery. Um, I might even, I, I don't recall if it, was a, if it was a genuine Apple battery or not, but I'm gonna take a look at it in a minute. Uh, for a while I was buying genuine batteries for these and then I gave up and started buying aftermarket because the genuine ones weren't really lasting very long. Um, but it does feature uh, Firewire 400, two USB 2.0 ports, a, um, a mini display port that also supports mirroring um, as well as extended desktop features, uh, which was a big deal because prior models didn't really uh, have that option. Um, it does have a DVD RW drive built in, a super drive. Um, but for the most part, this one has never been serviced. I've never had this one apart. Um, it's bone stock. Aside from the RAM upgrade that I just did yesterday, it's all stock all the way. Um, oh, yeah. This also has a built-in EyeSight camera, which most of our laptops did not have. Ah, maybe they did. Yes, they did. They did have that. I, I, I had to think about that for a minute. Um, but it does have the EyeSight camera. Um, so really not much else to say about it other than it's a pretty cool laptop. Um, if I keep 1068 on it, I can run legacy software, but I have a lot of Mac laptops to, to choose from at this point. My collection is starting to explode, and I'm going to have to do something about culling the herd because it's, it's getting a little ridiculous. One other bonus feature is it does have the infrared sensor right on the front of the keyboard. It's located right here. So you can use your front row remote with this device um, if you have one. Smoke them if you got them. Um, I have never found a practical use for the front row remote other than back when I had an iMac in my bedroom, I used to use it as a, as a jukebox and I could adjust the volume with the remote, but Apple has since taken a hard stance against having remotes paired with their devices. Don't know why, but I think it was a cool feature. I mean, it was one of the, one of the many reasons why you'd pony up the $1,400 for a base model iMac. Because it had a remote, you know. Uh, this one also features Bluetooth. Most of the laptops that we bought, we, we, we ordered the educational models. And the educational models lacked some features like Bluetooth. Um, I know the iMacs definitely lacked the Bluetooth option. And they didn't come with the remotes. And there was a few other things that they were lacking that you wouldn't really think of. Um... So yeah, as of right now, um, you know, we have completely removed these from our, from our uh, inventory. 
Um, we, do, we no longer have any Core 2 Duo Max of any kind. They are completely gone. And uh, it's nice to find one that has actually survived, you know, the, the test of time and is still a fully functional and cosmetically intact uh, machine. Let's take a look at the battery health. I'm actually kind of wondering about that. The good thing about these uh, these old Macs is that they still featured um, battery life and diagnostic info. So let's see what we got going on here. So the battery has 25 cycle accounts, but it is in service battery um, status, which is not a good thing. Uh, the battery is, uh, according to its own diagnostics, in um, degraded condition. Um, full charge capacity is 3875 milliamp hours. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, there's a lot of information missing, and that's probably why it's in service battery uh, status. Uh, because it's missing lot number, serial number, hardware version, revision, cell information. And these are all bits of information that a factory battery would have. So let's take a look at what kind of battery I put in it because I think, I think it's an aftermarket unit. So that would explain a few things. Just looking at it, I can tell you it's definitely aftermarket. Um, I had some really good ones and some really bad ones, um, and they were kind of a gamble. Whenever I'd order a pile of batteries, you never know what you're going to get um, because suppliers keep changing their suppliers, and it's uh, it was a real gamble. One of the great things about these, yeah, this is this is one of the cheap ones, but it has some weight to it, which tells me that it has full-sized cells, which is. Um, that's actually a good thing. But what I liked about these old MacBooks is you could replace the battery. You could you could fill a briefcase with batteries and do it, take an international flight if you wanted to, and you'd have plenty of power to, to go. Uh, but they were easily replaceable with a coin. And underneath the battery uh, compartment, you have your um, pertinent information, your serial number, Ethernet ID, airport ID, system specs, 2.4. Uh, it had 2 gigs of RAM, 250 gig hard drive, and uh, it was in black. So, there you go. Now, to get to the hard drive, um, you simply remove or uh, loosen these three screws here, and then this metal um, band would just come undone. You've got your two memory slots here, so you can do memory upgrades without any major disassembly. Hard drive slides out, has a pull tab. And it just pulls right out, and you can put whatever you want in there. You can put a solid-state disk in here. You can put another hard drive in it if you want to. And I'm going to share with you some of my own experiences working on these. So I never worked on this particular laptop um, in the field, but we did have a couple hundred uh, MacBooks, uh, white MacBooks, um, of this of this generation, and they were um, they were frequent flyers in my shop. I. I cannot tell you how many motherboards I've replaced, how many hard drives I've replaced, um, and just general repairs like keyboard replacements, um, vandalism repair. I had a video that I made a long time ago that's still up there somewhere where I showed my method for repairing vandalized keyboards. The keyboards are getting very expensive and my boss was starting to look for, um, his, was asking me to find ways to uh, kind of cut back. So I'm like, well, let me see what I can do. So what I did is I devised a method of repairing keyboards that had not only the keys ripped off of them, um, but the rubber domes ripped off as well. So I'd have a stockpile of scrap keyboards and I would actually cut the rubber dome and the supporting plastic out of a scrap keyboard and I would glue it in place on the one I was fixing. And that repair was 100% successful. I, I had no issues uh, with those keyboards since. They never came back for, for malfunctioning keys or any of that, any of that nonsense. Um, because these keys are not tamper resistant and we had a lot of that where I work. So um, I saved a lot of keyboards on these just by doing my own hacky repairs and, and it worked successfully every time. 
And there's a video on the web that I put up a long time ago that shows exactly what I was doing. Um, so what else can I tell you? If you have a MacBook, um, be it white or black, would be original 80 gig Hitachi hard drive. Um, definitely want to replace that drive. Do it right now. <laughs> Make a time machine backup of the drive if you want to and recover it on a new drive because those 80 gig Hitachi drives have a nearly 100% failure rate. Um, I want to say that literally every single one we had failed. And it didn't affect any of the other drives. And I believe it was a, a defect in the head assembly. And what would happen is all of a sudden the machine would just fail to boot. And you'd hear a repetitive clicking sound. And I'm fairly certain that it was a, um, a defective head stack assembly or something similar. Could have been a control, could have been anything. But it was always the same pattern, the same failure, and it was only on the 80 gig drives. This one has got the 250. I didn't have any of those come in. I had some 160s come in uh, for the same problem, but the 80s were like, it was a non-stop. For, for about two months, I was replacing like three drives a day. It was that bad. Um, it was, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I did every one of them at one point in time. And I was doing them under warranty at first, and Apple would ship me a brand new 80 gig drive. And uh, eventually the warranties went out, and I started buying, um, I think I was buying 160 gig Western Digitals. And those weren't much better. I had a lot of those go bad too, um, the 160s. But um, this, was been, this was back when, you know, mechanical hard drives were, were a bit pricey. I was, I was, it was costing us around 75 bucks a machine. Uh, to fix them, and um, yeah, such is life. But anyway, what else can I tell you? I had a lot of motherboard failures go. Um, that, that made no sense. I had a lot of motherboard failures on the um, on the early Core 2 Duo models that we bought. It wasn't like a daily thing, but it was it was it was common enough to where I had to start stocking motherboards uh, for the MacBooks. Um, Interestingly enough, I didn't have a lot of issues with their screens. Uh, they were pretty durable, pretty well packaged. So, you know, you could drop one of these and not break the screen. Um, but, yeah, they were, uh, they were something else. Um, oh, and the optical drives. You know, I kind of wonder if this one works. The optical drives also had a super high failure rate on these. Um, to the point where I actually started asking people not to use them. And I started handing out um, external drives because they were just constantly going bad. And it was getting expensive. I buy them from Apple and they charge me about $120 a pot. And, um, and this was back when the aftermarket parts supply was pretty bad. So um, let me see if it works. Because they, again, they, they were always going bad on these machines. Unfortunately, I lost my one copy of Mac OS 10.6.3, um, which is what I would use normally to wipe off one of these machines, but that's okay. What I have here is a copy of iLife on DVD, so we're going to test it with a DVD and a CD, because sometimes the DVD lens would go and the CD lens would work, or diode, sorry. Two different diodes, or maybe three, and one would go, the other one would still work. So you'd wind up with machines that could read DVDs, but not CDs, vice versa, or they could read but not write, or sometimes they would write and not read. Or they wouldn't eject. Or they wouldn't inject. It was a, it was a real thing, you know what I mean? Okay, it looks like iLife works. iLife 11. I'm gonna eject that, see how she ejects. Oh, yeah. And, okay, it works. Sometimes, I mean, you'd have machines that, you know, as a tech, I'd have to explain to people that, yes, even though you never used your CD-ROM drive, and you're using it now for the first time ever, it's bad because <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to be used to go bad, which is freaking messed up. Um, you could have a brand new drive and it just 
goes bad. Boom, doesn't work anymore. Sorry, too bad, so sad. It happens all the time. And you have to explain to someone that yes, your $2,700 MacBook Pro has the same poorly designed drive as a $500 gateway laptop that you buy at Walmart because cheapness is a thing. Okay, so it reads CDs and DVDs. I'm not gonna bother testing its write capability because I'm pretty sure it's, at this point, I'm, I'm confident enough that it's good enough to, to eat. But um, yeah, so look at that, a survivor. Um, now to make it right, I should have to definitely look at getting a, um, a proper black battery, but it won't be an OEM battery because those are impossible to find, so at least in working condition. So I might just leave well enough alone. And it's funny, you know, I thought, I was I was certain, I told the person who bought this laptop and or ordered it, and I said, listen, hang on to this. Uh, don't scrap it because these will be worth something. I thought for sure, I was predicting the future that the black MacBooks would become collector's items because I thought they were rare. They're not rare, they're not collector's items, they're worthless but they're cool and this one's a survivor so it's gonna live on for now thank you for watching there's your computer video i hope it uh, satisfied your needs and maybe you enjoyed watching that video um i would love to know where the disc goes if you happen to know where i left it um, i think i left it in a machine that i scrapped no really i <laughs> yeah I I I, uh, I was always pretty bad with CDs. I'd lose them all the time because I'd leave them in the drives and then send the machine back to where it came from. And oh crap, where's my ah? Anyway, so I think I lost my 1063 DVD CD whatever. Is this, this is a CD right? Yeah, I think I lost it, and I'll never see it again. Thanks for watching. Have a nice day.